For those who don't know me, my name's Rob McKay. I'm a partner in charge of the consulting practice here at Future Partners. And I guess it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome everybody here this evening um, and to introduce our panel guests um, from both Marshall, Stent and Wilmot and Future Partners. The Australian Information um, Commissioner has had 964 um, cyber breaches in the last 12 months. 60% um, of those have been malicious attacks. So it's a real and ever-growing problem what we can talk about and discuss tonight. If you overlay that with the changes from a privacy legislation perspective, and from you know the recent introductions of GDPR, um, it's a really becoming a very complex and difficult space to navigate your way through. Um, it's certainly way more than just a technology issue for organisations today. So as a result of that, um, what we thought we would do is get together a panel of people that are dealing with this topic every day, both from a, a legal, technical and a risk perspective, um, and create a panel to debate and discuss some of these challenges that we're facing. So for me now, I'd like to introduce, maybe if I get all four of you up first, and then um, I'll introduce each of you. So come on down. structures and governing documentation, exit transactions, funding rounds and compliance with applicable regulatory requirements under Australian consumer law and privacy le legislation. Next to Josh is Zung Bang, again from Marshall's Den Pullman. Zung is a commercial and privacy lawyer with experience in complex terms of service and privacy compliance saying that's complex. Um, with a passion for technology and digital law, she has represented businesses in all, of all sizes across various fields, including IT, cyber security, high technology, media and entertainment. Next, um, we have Eric Eckhoff from Future Partners. Eric's a principal consultant um, in the consulting practice um, and has spent the last 20 years in the cyber security space, both domestically here and at an international level. His in-depth knowledge of information security and technical background allows Eric to be a trusted advisor to both executives and technical staff. And last but not least, uh, here on my right, Alistair Phillips. Alistair's a senior risk manager in our, um, in our risk um, consulting practice. With diverse experience in the provision of risk and compliance advice, he helps businesses to develop and modify risk and compliance frameworks, ensuring they align with their core objectives and cultures. Please join me in welcoming the floor of the panel. My last introduction is Martin Fauvel over here on my left. Mark is the client director in our team, and he's going to have the fun uh, job of facilitating the, this evening's um, conversation. So thank you, enjoy, and um, I'll hand over to Mark. Thanks, Rob. Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's great that you could uh, all be here with us this evening. Uh, it's turned out to be quite a nice evening out there despite the uh, early shower, so I don't want to talk about the way here. So uh, today we're going to explore two areas that many organisations are grappling with. 
uh, and that is the handling of private information and also protecting against cyber threats. And uh, what we'd like to do tonight is have a look at how those two topics intersect uh, and also hopefully give you some tips on how you can best address both of them. And we're really going to do that in an interactive way also by looking at a couple of case, real case studies. So I think it always makes it a bit more real and tell stories of what's been happening uh, in the recent past. So today's session will be quite interactive and uh, that actually includes asking you to share some information with us anonymously, of course, but we're going to uh, ask you some questions about how you and your organisation is dealing with these issues right now. And then we'll share the results or the collated results with you after the event. So hopefully you'll find that interesting as well. So with that in mind, can I ask you all to take out your devices and browse to slido.com and put in that <coughs> code there, cyber19. And we'd like to start off the evening with a survey question. So just while everyone's getting ready, the, uh, the question that we're posing first up this evening is, if you use third party providers anywhere in your business, how do you know whether they keep your data secure and private? You've got four options there to choose from. You might be able to see all four of them. Oh yeah, they're all on the screen there. We've got a couple of answers in. I'll just wait for a few more people to uh, put in their results. some results coming through. So we can come back to the results, but in the meantime, what we can do is move to our first case study. So some of you may be aware of this incident which took place in September 2016. Uh, there was a data breach of the Australian Red Cross blood service, and over half a million personal records were made publicly available on a web server, so basically publicly, publicly on the web. And uh, this information, personal information about prospective blood donors who were registered, and some of the sensitive, so it actually included information about how police and sexual behaviours, as well as other personal information that potentially could be quite damaging. Luckily, no adverse consequences were identified. How that happened was actually accidental. So the data was being worked on by a third party IT contractor. They accidentally saved it in a spot that they shouldn't, and it became publicly available. And somebody anonymously downloaded it. I'm not quite sure what they did with it, and then they notified the blood service. So, what can we learn from this breach? The Privacy Commissioner, so the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, did an investigation and they found that the root cause was human error. However, there were two contributing factors, and one of those was what they call the absence of contractual measures on the blood service. So, this is about the contract between the blood service and the third party provider. The other issue was that that data shouldn't have been kept at all. There was no need for the blood service to actually contain the data. And the result was an impossible undertaking from the Commissioner. So the Blood Service team did a lot of rectification work to improve their practices. With that, I'd like to throw this to the panel uh, to explore what we can learn and I suppose how organisations can avoid these sorts of incidents. Josh, did you want to tell that first? Hello. Yes. <laughs> it's a bit louder than I thought. Um, one of the interesting things that came out of this case was the, I guess, 
failure by an organisation the size of Red Cross to have adequate security measures in relation to sensitive information. Um, and the findings of the eventual hearing um, were such that they were quite clearly in breach of um, Australian Privacy Principle Number 11, in that they had no um, design mechanism in relation to where their data was stored, who could access the data, um, who could potentially tinker with their data, and um, the fact that it was stored by, eventually stored on a third party uh, platform. Um, it's incumbent on Red Cross uh, to ensure that they know full well who is accessing that data at any one time. And it was a significant failure by Red Cross not to um, have those mechanisms in place. One of the other interesting things that um, the four of us have spoken about is the absence of contractual protections. So, precedent being the uh, holder of the data um, was where the data leakage occurred. And in Red Cross's supply contracts with precedent, they had no protection at all in the event there was a data breach by precedent. So what Zong and I often do in our contracts when we have for uh, companies is that we include protections that the whoever ends up holding the data about clients um, not only ensures that it's adequately protected and that they've got oversight as to who can access it at any one time, but that the eventual holder of the data, be it a third party contractor or otherwise, has cyber protection insurance and um, provides indemnities to um, our clients to ensure that, uh, uh, that our clients are effectively protected. So my take on that is, um, again, it really reinforces the fact that copying and pasting is not acceptable and it's, it's no longer good enough, especially when it comes to privacy policy, um, privacy uh, protection mechanisms um, in the workplace. We can't copy and paste that. It's something that we really need to pay attention to because every case is unique and you need to work with your internal stakeholders to work out where your data is, um, mapping out the data flows, um, who's the third party that you're contracting to process and hold and handle data for you. And, um, and all of that comes in together. It's no longer a tick of, tick of a box exercise. It has to be overall organizational um, attention. And, and it's, the attitude is changing um, in, in the space, so that, that's a good thing. And um, what's interesting to note is that this, this case happened shortly before the notifiable data which has been put into place in February last year. Um, so I'm not going into it in detail, um, but essentially what it does requires companies um, bound by the Privacy Act to notify the, the affected individuals and the commissioner, the, the OAIC, of, um, of a data breach um, or a suspected data breach. So um, it's interesting to see um, how, how this has changed the, the Australian privacy law landscape because um, especially us as lawyers, we, like Josh said before, we have to ensure that our clients are properly protected on that front in that um, when they engage a contract as a third party contract provider, we need to make sure that our clients, our clients are protected um, you know, with appropriate contracting measurements in place. And um, it's, it, it, it also a very interesting, um, it, it, it brings up an interesting point about um, you know, can, um, holding information in, in cloud platforms well, because even though it's not really discussed as can, but a lot of companies do that they hold their data in cloud platforms like AWS, um, Google, um, and Microsoft. So how does com how, how do companies navigate that? Um, it's, Single exercise. It's definitely multi factor. Yeah. yeah, look, I, I think the, um, I just probably emphasize from this perspective, uh, just really understanding the data. And I think that when you see the, the information, the sensitive information that was being stored, a few things that stood out to me, uh, certainly around the work that we do, is really asking the question, uh, you know, what's the risk of that getting out? And here I think that that, that 
I, I'm pretty sure that they had uh, good oversight on the fact that on what the information was, but it really, I, I think it was lost potentially on the, on the contractor as to um, you know, the people that getting out. And, and I suppose that warrants the, the other question in terms of uh, with that risk is really about understanding uh, with those third parties, well, is that the best third party that the risk is, is so significant? And I, I think that that's the bit that, um, that, that stood out for me on this one is, um, you know, was this the best the best uh, third party? And I suppose that's the question I think back to, to the audience is around when you are using third parties, is where it really comes back to um, the risk of that information gets out for uh, you know, a, a, a better uh, third party provider than a, um, than a worse one. Um, looking at it from a security perspective, you know, as you touched on, this is very much a third party risk. Um, and third party risk, as already been explained, is becoming more and more prevalent and more and more important, really, because all companies now start to rely more and more third parties, including cloud services, but also small service providers, especially in small and business department. Um, and it's very much about understanding what controls these third parties have in place to protect your information. You're still responsible for this information, you're still liable for this information, so it's up to you to make sure that your third party has the right controls in place. And we often do that as part of an initial third party security assessment, at least from a security perspective, um, where we start reviewing all the different security procedures, governance, structures, and technical controls to ensure how they operate, and then we make a decision on whether we actually trust this party with our information. And this is becoming very commonplace. Um, one, especially in the financial sector where EPRA has just published CPSD before, third party risk is becoming a huge issue. And we now start to see that a lot of very large financial organizations are starting to do third party risk assessments on their suppliers, which are often SMEs. So we already help a variety of SMEs navigating these large questionnaires and helping them understand all these security controls that these large corporates actually request from them, um, which are often defined, written with a large enterprise in mind, but small medium businesses need to that somehow technically relevant for them. And that's where your risk perspective really comes in. Do you understand the risk and how it is applicable to you? What is your risk at the time? And how will you make sure that you're aligned with all these controls, but still somehow might be something to do with budget and resources. One of the um, problems with the dichotomy between the large organisations and the smaller organisations, as Eric was touching on, there's the contracts that the large organisations often give to the SMEs are so loaded in favour of the larger organisations. And there's pages and pages of compliance requirements that the SMEs are required to comply with and in many circumstances they just don't have the resources to be able to comply. I know Eric, we spoke about ISO testing and um, those sorts of things that are incredibly expensive and um, unfortunately small to medium enterprises are actually getting um, not, not awarded tenders on the basis that they don't, they can't comply because the compliance measures required from many of the larger organisations are, are so so expensive and affected by the line. Yeah, just, just to add on that, um, yes, the pages are, are many pages, are many of them controlled. Um, but what you really should be doing as an organization is not just take that as a list that you need to tick off on every box. What you really need to start doing is first do a risk assessment and understand the risk is actually applicable to you. And maybe half the list is something no longer relevant. Or you can say that that is within your risk appetite, which is also acceptable to the large organization. But it's being able to navigate your ways through that assessment and being able to formulate your position in the right manner that also convinces these large corporates. And you, as a small business, need to be the same towards your support. So if you're a small business in a particular industry, and you, you're not in IT, but you do have some IT, so you probably rely on small IT provider, the same principles apply, just on a smaller scale. And I also have one thing to add is, um, since the introduction of the new Cloud Scheme, the OIC has really stressed the importance of 
conducting a privacy, sorry, um, I'm not sure if you guys have heard it before, but it's called privacy impact assessment, which is a 10 step assessment for each project that deals with uh, personal information. So what it is, is that you create, you, um, you pretty much implement a document that follows you from the beginning of the project to the end of the project. And um, it's a very important document because in the event that there's a data breach and there's an investigation from the OIC, and if there's a lack of control in the place and you don't have anything to show for, it's risky because you can't say to the commission, oh, you have done everything you could, but you haven't done privacy assessment, so you haven't got a data response, a data response plan in place. Um, and there's a lot of resources about, about this. In fact, there's actually a free course on the OIC website on how to conduct a privacy assessment. I've done it, it's actually really cool. It's got cartoon figures, and, you know, it's, it's really, really, really fun. So um, if that's something that you're interested in or if you're, if you're doing, um, you're undertaking, undertaking it on the market as well, it's definitely something that you're interested in. Just a good point about uh, assessing what data you're dealing with and uh, taking appropriate steps based on the sensitivity of that. You want to ask something here? Uh, just one last comment on the insurance that Josh mentioned. Um, cyber insurance is a really emerging market. Um, it looks great on paper, but you read the fine print. <laughs> and it looks great on paper and on the fine print until you get an incident. Then there's certainly lots of discussion about what to do or what to do not to do. Um, so, um, I'm not saying that cyber insurance is not a good idea. I do say that it's very important to read all the fine print and get some assistance to make sure that you're really covered. Uh, and I also want to stress that insurance is not uh, a control by itself. It's your last resort, really. It shouldn't stop you from getting the free control, which will also lower your insurance. I'm going to change tack a little bit now and uh, talk about cyber attacks. So I'm going to ask you to go back to your device and uh, answer the question that's on the page there. What we're interested to understand here is, is your organisation prepared for a cyber attack? This man's is coming in.
think it's worth just taking a moment to understand what impact this breach had on Landmark One. So, as I said, it's a property valuation firm. Their four biggest clients would be four banks, and all four of them temporarily stopped dealing with Landmark One. Um, on top of that, it's a publicly listed company, so the firm was dealing with the ASX to make sure that they've got continuous disclosure going on. On top of that, they were dealing with the cleanup and securing their networks, trying to understand what had happened. They spent more than seven million dollars on that activity alone. And uh, the impairment to their revenue and their profits was significant. So they went from a 5.8 million dollar profit with the tax in the 18, 2018 financial year to a loss of 15.6 million dollars. The CEO resigned in March. Got a new CEO now. They had to issue uh, updated guidance around their revenue and profits. And share trading was suspended twice, once for nearly three months from February to May, and then again from June to late August. So uh, it's sort of hard to understate how much impact this had on this business. Um, I suppose the difficulty is that sabotage from the inside by someone in a position of trust is very difficult to avoid altogether. But uh, it would be interesting to hear from the panel members about what can be done to mitigate these sorts of things. Sure. Um, maybe I'll start and then we'll hand over to uh, Eric to get the uh, insight on how to deal with saboteurs. But um, I think for when I saw this case, um, I think that really stood out for me was just, I suppose, as um, in terms of the internal audit work we do, we often uh, look at the, the basic controls in the organisation around um, background checking of employees. Uh, now, that's not a, a complete different for this, for this scenario, but certainly um, having those basic um, structures in place to assess uh, the um, the employees are, uh, when they come into the organisation is a really important point. Uh, but I think more, more generally that it, it comes down to the compliance culture that's established that actually, uh, I, suppose, um, uh, I suppose, helps to prevent this by, by, uh, by people being aware of that compliance culture and knowing that um, the likelihood that they've been, been, um, uh, been um, captured is, uh, is going to be tracked. So uh, I think for me, I'd start with the, um, the, the basic checks in terms of people coming into your organisation, uh, and then I suppose it goes into compliance culture and how you establish that compliance culture to give that, that sense that uh, there is monitoring going on, and if you if you do want to um, go and do these things, you are likely to get caught. But it is a, it is a very complex case, but you can see the, uh, the value that we've lost on this organisation. Uh, it can have extremely um, detrimental. Uh, I fully agree with all that. What I was just uh, sorry, the threat is one of the scariest things to deal with, really. Um, obviously, these people are coming to your organization. If you have a position of trust, if you have a certain level of access to systems that they just need for them all, really. Um, having said that, this particular gentleman was able to get access to a database that he wasn't supposed to have access to. So there's certainly something to be said around police privilege. Um, there's also something to be said around those HR checks, but those HR checks are often a one-off. Yeah. It happens when you start at the beginning of your employment. In certain cases where people have access to sensitive information, it might be more welcome, a little bit more frequent. Um, there is also, I think, something worth noticing with the change of behavior. This gentleman has been there for 12 years. There is obviously something that upsets him, something that um, changes his behavior from what you would usually expect. I wouldn't be surprised if that was already noticeable just the way he operates on a daily basis and how he interacts with his uh, colleagues. I have to say there are also some systems in place that actually monitor how people behave and what is common in certain departments. So he does some things like looking up certain websites and how to extract data on a daily basis, etc., which is not common in your department and we actually need to up. But the bigger thing is really that this particular system that the gentleman had access to in this database is really the core 
of his organization. His whole organization gives the grades of the database and house valuations that get used at big banks. It's their core function. So if this is your core function, if this is the heart of your organization, then you should have plenty of monitoring around it to see who has actually got access to it, what that person is doing. And if you have the database administrator that needs to make a database change, that's fine. If you have someone who is suddenly making a full copy of a database to his own personal workstation, not so good. You should have picked that up, really. And then the next step is that that person is actually able to publish that on a publicly accessible website, which means he's also able to upload it. Again, something you should have monitored, you should have stopped doing. So, incident threat and comes with certain privileges, but it doesn't mean you can't do anything. And yes, you really need to be very aware and monitor, especially for the process. Um, I'm going to let Josh talk a little bit about the practice side of it, because I
and that is not a fine covered by the organization, it's you. I'll give you six examples of highlights that really in this case the privacy breach may have been a secondary consideration for them because they were the reputation damage and the hit to their revenue was at a point where it was directly impacting the business and on top of that they got the revenue for each year as well. So these are the answers from the uh, question we just posed. It's quite interesting to see it's relatively evenly balanced, equally balanced between the three. Oh yeah. Question. Question. Yep. Okay. So it looks like a, a well informed audience in this room. One person didn't vote on the second question. That's right. <laughs> tips out of that. We thought we'd cover now some common questions that uh, we as the two firms represented on the panel here get from our clients. Hopefully talking through those may help you and then after that we'll open it up to questions from the floor of course. So we'll get you to tell us a little bit more about your organisation, this time in relation to GDPR. And perhaps as people are putting in their answers, I'll ask the panellists uh, if they'd like to comment on the GDPR issues they're seeing. Josh, what's did you want to talk about this? Uh, yeah, so the, the GDPR, the, you know, the Data I think one of the other one of the other things further to what Song was talking about was that Australian companies generally think that they don't need to comply with the GDPR because it's some legislation based in the EU and it's not relevant. But it's as Zong was saying, it's so far reaching that even if you sell or market your services to a customer who just happens to be located in the EU, the tentacles of the GDPR spread so far and wide that um, compliance is mandatory and but for that reason, when we advise Australian-based clients, we always stress the fact that you need to make your privacy policy not only Australian 
um, privacy law compliant, but also GDPR compliant. And it also future proofs that organisation as well, because um, even though they may not be marketing their services to EU residents right away, they may want to scale up, or presumably they would, especially if it's a startup space, they may want to look to expand their service offering to those areas. And that's where ensuring you have the appropriate protections at the outset is really important. And then down the well, I mean, uh, in, in the financial sector, um, next, uh, the aim for, for the government in 2020 is to introduce um, consumer data rights. So this is a separate set of, of data rights that apply to consumer. And the banking industry is going to be the one that will be hit first. So what that means is that essentially what it means is you now as a consumer have the right to um, to let uh, direct the bank to, uh, to transfer your data to a trusted party. So this is actually a to what we call the right to portability under the GDPR. Um, so you know, like, like Eric said, um, the government is trying really hard to give people back their rights to their data. Um, and the way Australian privacy laws is going, it's going to be high up there with the GDPR. So Unfortunately, <laughs> it's the kind that, you know, that is a bit, 
bit more. Um, so you, you, you would have seen these cookie statements everywhere, on every website. And uh, when, when the, the GDPR was introduced, everyone panicked because what I find one of the most interesting things about GDPR is their definition of uh, personal information, or sorry, personal data compared to the definition of personal information in Australia. It's much broader. And um, under the GDPR, it includes uh, identification number, uh, geolocation, uh, location data, online identifier. So what that means is that with the complexity of, of cookie technology these days, it, it just falls under the GDPR. Um, and it's, it's so broad, uh, much broader than the Australia. It's, it's one of those things that um, when you log onto a website, you see a, a pop-up saying, I accept the cookies, but no one really knows what they're accepting. Right. Um, and that's why um, you see we've given some examples of a GDPR compliant cookie statement versus just a normal cookie statement. Um, and it's really important to actually go behind what information you're collecting and inform your customers um, of, of that, as opposed to just a bland, dear customer, this package collects cookies. Sorry, I forgot this one, the essentially, it's a little, um, little thing in the railroad that actually tracks your activity on the web browser. Uh, it also, um, in a lot of cases, it actually allows your browser experience to be a bit more exposed, a bit more, um, I guess from a data analysis perspective, it allows people to track your activity to see where your preferences are. And you know one of those things where you, you just you look at a, 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 a holiday and then the next day Facebook advertises to you a holiday in another place, and, that's what it does, uh, essentially. Um, so it, it's, it's become, the technology itself has become very complex. And um, so just, just you know, um, mention that very, mention it very quickly. So that cookie statement over there is no longer considered um, compliant. And um, it's so, so uh, the, uh, the Information Commission in the UK came out with a statement that cookies, cookies are no longer permitted. So what that means is that if they make it impossible for you to browse uh, the website without um, accepting the cookies uh, collection statement, that means they are not compliant with the GDPR. So what that means is they now have to give you a choice whether to accept cookies or to reject the cookies. We'll change gears a little bit now, and we'd like to ask you a question around biometric information. So if you'd like to get your devices out again, we're wondering whether any of the organisations represented here handle or collect biometric data. So Zong, did you want to talk a little bit about how this is covered under the Privacy Act? Uh, yeah, so um, biometric data um, Unbeknownst to a lot of people, it's actually it, it actually falls under the sensitive data category, um, so the sensitive information category of the Privacy Act. So it is it is there, um, but it's not very well regulated in, in Australia at the moment, um, just because it's such a new piece of technology. And um, and the reason that we sort of brought it up today is because there recently there is a very interesting case um, whereby. Um, an employee refused to give his fingerprint to his employer and um, he got dismissed, um, which then prompted um, his unfair dismissal um, uh, proceeding in Fair Work. And in some instance, the um, Fair Work Commission um, found that he, um, there was no unfair dismissal and he appealed the decision all by himself, um, saying, uh, claiming that um, the finger, so fingerprint is his is his personal data. It is his right to refuse the collection of his fingerprint. And more importantly, when he signed on, when he signed on a contract with the employer, there was no such thing as um, a fingerprint. So um, he essentially argued that for sensitive information to be used, there has to be express consent. And the employer didn't do that. So the full bench of the commissioner um, upheld that. Uh, sorry, that argument and one against. Um, so it, it's really interesting because it reinforces the, the principle that there's one thing to have personal information, there's another thing to have to, to 
to collect and use sensitive information um, because it requires a much, a much higher threshold of consent of collection and use of disclosure. It's probably something for Eric and Alistair and yeah. Martin's clients as well in the finance sector or the banking sector because there's this new push for two-touch authentication with uh, both fingerprint and facial recognition and it's interesting to think about the companies who now collect that information, what kind of disclosure requirements they provide back to their um, to their customers and whether they're compliant with the relevant legislation in, in doing that. So, it's, I haven't worked in the security industry, I can't across part of that. Um, but it's certainly growing interest. I mean, to be honest, while working in all these organizations, I never thought about giving my consent, so I guess I never took that legal perspective. Uh, but I did realize very early on that biometric information is actually really, really sensitive because it's just another way to uniquely identify an individual, to uniquely identify a person, which you then can use to be authorized someone accessibility or uh, access and application, etc. Um, the downside is that you need to store that information really well, because if you lose it, I'm not able to reset my fingerprint. <laughs> so, well, I think I just add to that, um, I suppose it's around the storage of, of the data and, uh, you know, as, as to Eric's point, I mean, it's, it's really about making making sure that that, uh, that biometric information is, is separated from um, the other personal information as well. So I think um, certainly what we've seen, in, uh, it's a bit like with the uh, PCI DSS compliance uh, about um, storage of credit card information and making sure that information is not, not stored in the same place. So while there is um, some upsides in terms of biometric data and what that enables to do and uh, ease of access, I think to, to Eric's point, there is um, there is a high degree of risk associated with the storage of that information, uh, and I suppose then it warrants to have the systems to actually adequately protect that, that information. So that's the, I suppose the killer. Just on that, what um, for Alistair and Eric uh, and Martin, what um, when you open up your iPhone and you have to show your face, where is that stored, and who can access that? So that information is stored on your phone, and if you have one of the more recent ones, your phone will uh, basically require you to encrypt it, which means that the information is stored encrypted on your phone. If you do use that function, the phone is not encrypted, I highly recommend to turn that function on now. <laughs> do you want to talk us through? <laughs> all right, well, we'll move on to a slightly different topic now. Probably a little bit closer to home. I think uh, privacy policies I'm sure nearly every organisation here would have one, but we're interested to understand whether you update it regularly. So while people are voting, perhaps I'll throw to the panel again and talk about the importance of this. Yeah, maybe why, why do you need to update the policy at all? Um, I, I think what we see in terms of our audits that we do often is that uh, organisations um, are not operating in a vacuum and there are changes to business processes uh, that are going on all the time and um, time and time again we come across uh, privacy policies that don't actually reflect the operations of the business uh, and therefore they don't actually reflect how the information is being, um, being used. So I suppose from a, a risk perspective is the, is the um, OAIC oh, yeah, so are going to come in and say, oh, we've well, identified that you're not, you're, you're not using the information according to the privacy policy. Probably not, but I think it just adds to uh, when they do come in and you do have a breach, this is the sort of stuff that they're going to pick you up on. They're going to go straight to look at the privacy policy. They're going to start with, you know, what is the information that's being collected? How is it being used? Is that being disclosed to the, to the, um, uh, to, to the customer in an adequate basis? I think the other thing that we've, um, I often like to see is also a layering approach. And this is where um, potentially that there's uh, at, the, at the point of collection, there's a very simple statement, um, but sitting behind that collection statement is a bit more complex policy. Um, and often that, that can tell the, the, uh, the customer about the full extent of the way that information is, is collected, used, and managed, and, and how they can get access to it. 
but I suppose going to what um, Zong said before, um, this is not an exercise of just copying and pasting someone else's advice and policy. It really needs to be a reflection of your business because ultimately this is almost um, a charter with your, with your, your customer as to how the, uh, you will use their information and how they can ex access it. So that actually needs to be reflected on your, your organisation. There's a few things to start off with. Privacy in principle, um, you are, as an organisation, you are actually required to keep your privacy policy up to date and easy to read and um, accessible free of charge. So it's a legal requirement to, it's not, you know, again, it's not just the phone to sign. It's, um, it's, I would say it's the first step to privacy requirement because it's, you know, it's the front, it's the front of the front back end. So, you know, people go to your website. They don't see a privacy policy there, or the privacy policy is must update five years ago. It's not a very good thing on, on the organization. But also, um, internally speaking, when you have such an outdated privacy policy, it means that you're, you're not aware of it, or you're not aware of the changes, but also your team is not aware of the changes in the space. So um, it's, it's definitely a good start if you want to talk about privacy. We've got one more survey question for you, but this time we're going to move to the topic of cyber security. And often when our clients talk to us about cyber security, the questions are quite technical. What sort of technical controls do we need in place? Is our firewall secure enough and so on? But we find that equally important, if not more important, is the issue of awareness across the whole organisation. So we're interested to understand how much is done in your organisation around cyber awareness to start? Eric, did you want to talk a little bit about this? Yeah, um, I guess in my 20 years in the cyber security, um, the industry has really moved on from, from being really an IT function, where it was all about getting the firewall in place and at some point you got the harvest. Um, it's really become or I would say a business function in its own right. Um, it's now a separate function with separate reporting lines, um, to often to executives and uh, even up to the board. Um, and I think the main reason for that is that people start to realize that security is so much more than just a little bit of technology. Uh, it's really that combination of people, process, and technology. And we, to be honest, you can spend billions on technology in the security space. We're not sure of any vendors or anything. But it's really the people that make your organization secure. It's that security awareness that we need in your organization. Because as we start to invest more and more in technology, it becomes actually easier for hackers to stop trying to attack your organization directly. They'll just try to influence your people and do relatively normal things like changing bank accounts or paying an invoice and your money just goes to walk them out of energy, no technology at all. Um, or they send you phishing emails uh, where you just click a link to reset your password and suddenly they have your credentials and then they are in like an insider and then the insider fed applies. Um, so we see more and more of that and it's actually becoming more about people than anything else really. It doesn't mean we don't need technology at all. There's a bit of technology component to it. There's probably a process component to it. For example, uh, payment limits and at certain points for four eyes. That's some other things we can do in it. But it's really about creating that awareness that sense that people are aware that they have a role to play in how your organization needs to become secure and stay secure. And that doesn't just help the organization, it also helps them personally. If we're able to raise the security awareness in our society in general, really, um, then it's not just the organizations and the corporates that profit from that, but also people in the region. Just to uh, just add to that, I mean, often, uh, you know, I think this is also where you bring in privacy awareness as well. So it's not just uh, um, running it through in conjunction with, uh, with each other, it's a really good way of um, continuing to get that focus around privacy while also um, focusing on your IT security. So I think the two work really well, hand in, hand in glove. 
um, and really to raise that awareness around the ongoing risk to business. But the very point really does come back to the individual. I mean, as you said, it's, if, you, if, you, if you have that individual um, who clicks on that, that, that dodgy link, that's the one that's going to bring you down. Yeah, we, so we work with a lot of customers where we put security awareness printing, and it's, you can either do it in person, and I show up, and I give a group of people some sort of education, and that's not what we do, to be honest. Um, but we more and more start to do that through automated platforms where people have to look at a certain video which tells you that they look, it takes five, ten minutes, there's a small questionnaire at the end, and it raises a little bit of awareness. But instead of me dropping by and doing this on an annual basis, you now have to do this on a monthly basis just for five or ten minutes. And it's that recurring message that really brings it in people's brains and organizations. Um, and that's just the educational part. On the other hand, we can also send fake phishing emails. So we send you a phishing email if you click the link. You don't get redirected to some malicious website that wants to see your credentials. Instead, you go to the platform that says that that was probably not the smartest move today. Here is some additional training. <laughs> and we roll this out all the time, and you get some very interesting results. We just did a phishing test for an organization, and we did this, this the first round. Um, and I think that about 60% of the organization actually picked the link. And of course, we tune the message towards what is relevant. So um, if it's July, we'll probably send you a message around uh, ATO tax time, and it's probably for well, click here for a message from the ATO. Um, if it's January and you work on financial years, we'll probably send you a message around the upcoming bonuses. We had a guy that actually picked the link 14 times. <laughs> it still doesn't know what his bonus is. No, um, so we can certainly find you it based on events that are coming up, things that are relevant in the industry, um, and you can see that if you tune that message well, that the click rate is actually quite high. Um, and if we can do that, real attackers do that as well. Um, so that combination of recurring training combined with these fake phishing emails, we create a lot of awareness. First few rounds are interesting, but you really should see the click rate go down by a All right, and with that, I think we'd, what we'd like to do is open the questions to the floor. So we've got a couple of roving microphones. If you've got a question, perhaps if you could just raise your hand and we'll get a mic over to you. that's generally held by the corporate, what is the most valuable data and what inadvertent purpose can that be used for? So how are we exposing our customer information? So do you mean just with that case in particular? Or in no, general? just in general, like what is the most useful data out there and how exposed and what's the risk assessment from a customer perspective? Yes. So I get the corporate side, that's easy, and I think reasonably well understood, but for the individual, like I know in America this year's um, health insurance data, yes, there's been a lot of trends in that. And I worked for a private health insurer for a while, and they don't hold, they not only hold the same information as a bank put on a customer, they also hold Medicare information and your Australian tax file number to me, so to me the risk is even bigger at a small not-for-profit health insurer than what it was for a, one of the big four banks that I used to work for. But then, in reality, who is using that data and for what untoward purpose? Right, so th thank you so much for clarifying. So in accordance with the latest OIP report, the most vulnerable data, um, the most vulnerable type of data that was exposed to, um, what's this, what, say 916 breaches, data breaches, is actually um, 
identification, so ID number, driver's license, um, and fo fo uh, followed by um, financial information. Um, and I, it's, it's interesting because when you really talk about cybersecurity, you have to, I think one large aspect of it is the black market of trading in personal information. So, um, uh, you know, in, in order to, to opt to ransomware um, against corporations, um, financial institutions, um, and different types, it depends on what kind of organization. So, what a lot of people don't understand is that you might think, oh, it's just a point on the oh, it's just a name. It's just a tax on a club. But that information can be, can, it's worth thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars in the black market. Um, and that's why, it, that's why you know, when you look at uh, ransomware, it um, depends on where, where it happens. Um, but the more, uh, I guess, uh, privileged or the more well-known institution, the, the, more, the higher the amount. I think, so that's the way. I think the other thing too, just to note, I suppose we're talking about value in terms of financial consequence. The other aspect to look at is in terms of um, the potential, um, I suppose, uh, consequences for people. So certain people have their identity um, and, and their, their phone numbers um, restricted purely on the basis that they are in um, certain circumstances where um, they don't want their identity. So domestic violence situation. So we, so as having worked for an energy company, we've certainly been in this scenario of having um, certain people who and, and customers who are um, who, who are purchasers of energy, but at the same time um, not in that position of being able to um, share their identity. So. I think that as well as looking at, I suppose, the potential financial impact, you've also got to look at what the, the personal impact is. Um, so certainly when you look at that, that first case study and you think about the sexual health information of individuals, um, and, and you know, I suppose the proportion of, um, mental, health in, um, of um, mental health illness in the, in the community, you've just got to be careful here in terms of um, that can also have some really detrimental outcomes for our, for our, uh, for our people. Um, from, a, from a people perspective as opposed to just from a financial perspective. So we shouldn't lose sight of just seeing that this information is um, wholly and solely from a, um, a financial or a reputational impact there. There may actually also be people um, outcome impacts as well. Yeah, that's a really great question. I guess value is determined mostly by whoever's interested in acquiring that data. Um, for me, I think biometric data is the big one to watch just because it's very safe. You can't erase it. You can erase a tax file number or you can change your name, even though it might be onerous and, and administratively burdensome to do so. But I think biometric data is the, the real, I think that's where there's going to be some serious value in the black market. Um, so if anybody's interested in trading in that area, uh, I, I caution you against it. Yeah, well-known and rather tragic data breach at, let's say, a dating website called Ashley Madison, and that actually resulted in a number of people taking their lives. So I guess yeah. at the extreme, the impact can be really, really severe. And I think at the end of the day, you don't know we browse the internet very differently. We, we, we all have things to hide, I'm sure. Um, and so I think a lot of the time, it's the value Very personal. It's, 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 that's why um, the economists coin, coin um, what, what do they say? Uh, data is important because it's so valuable. It's valuable because it's it's irreplaceable. Um, yeah. Got any other questions out there in the audience? Perhaps one down here. And, uh, okay. Um, I just thought. Uh, 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 kind of like an indirect uh, question uh, that I was thinking about when you were, uh, when Pat was talking about uh, some issues regarding software privacy. And like, from my point of view, you start to think, what is it almost like inevitable that this is always going to be the case? Um, so is it a game now that we're playing like an issue to almost paying security or uh, uh, companies or services to avoid the negligence aspect of it as opposed to, you know, if there's actually an ever be a solution that can actually happen. Because you see major corporations that 
I would think have significant amount of money to, uh, you know, hire the best of the best in terms of security to, to prevent their company and corporations from getting hacked, but they still get hacked. Um, so I'm wondering if, you know, are we heading you know, towards the uh, technology needs to look further feed into that, or, you know, where, where is the mindset now that we should be focusing on is it like going to actually individuals for example, you have face app, and everybody was you know, trying to see what it looked like in 60 years from now. But at the same time, it was giving away the information of facial and all this other um, stuff that was going on. So regardless of the other side, there's still another side to, uh, to the educational aspect of, uh, of having to understand these things. It's a question that we get very into this part of there are a few things in there, but let me start with phase out. Phase out is a great app that some people play with it. It's a typical example of a third party risk. I install an app on a third party. Did I assess what the risk is of using that app? Probably not. I trusted it Google or Apple to do that for me. Obviously, this a um, If you talk about, I guess, the what I almost call it security red race, but how long is a piece of string? And you can invest millions and still get hacked, so at some point is it still worth it? Um, I think it's still worth it. Obviously, you need to be, um, you need to carefully assess what the risk really is and then define what, you, what controls you think are reasonable to have in place. You shouldn't overspend. Um, if you do implement security controls, which obviously cost money, you still lower the likelihood of an event happening. So, yes, you might get hacked, but the chance of it happening is actually less. If you are a very large bank, for example, with 40,000 people, I don't know how many divisions, and millions of business processes that rely on 100,000 third parties, yes, there's going to be security breaches. But if you get the right systems and processes in place, you can significantly lower that. Um, so I do think it's worthwhile, but yes, you do need to assess uh, what is reasonable. And one of the ways to also minimize your cost, and I know that's not that easy for a large bank, is to actually simplify your business. Do you really need to five CRM systems? Do you really need to use Google Cloud, Azure, AWS, and maybe now upcoming Alibaba. Choose one. Secure that one really well instead of trying to do a whole four, even though it might be the shiniest bit on the block. So if you really simplify your business, if you streamline your business, you're probably already saving 75% of the cost. It's just that large businesses, especially, are really bad at it. I suppose the other point is that even though you might not be able to prevent a breach if you're prepared can make the impact much, much less than it otherwise would be. Certainly agree. Uh, that's a you know, landmark like case is an example of that. I think we've got a question over what that. I think when it comes down to, um, 
suppose creating an opportunity to, um, you know, I suppose a lot of companies go through um, adversity, and uh, you know they are they go through. You know, I think, I think uh, a number of them would have received um, email about certain companies being hacked or uh, they've had privacy breaches, and it's certainly interesting to see how certain organisations respond to that. And I think a lot of the stuff that we talked about today, for organisations that do it well, uh, it can demonstrate that they've actually got a process behind it to actually put you at ease. So I think there is an opportunity here for, for organisations to demonstrate um, that they have a, an effective cyber um, uh, breach response plan in place. And I think that really comes back to, first of all, um, knowing their systems and knowing their processes, and also knowing the vulnerabilities that go with that. Also providing the information to the to the client to the customer uh, about what's going on. So I think that um, certain organisations will probably send out a vague statement just to say, well, you've been hacked, and um, we're really sorry about that, but you won't happen next time. Um, shame on us. Thanks. Other organisations will, will do a better job in terms of providing you with updates to sort of say, okay, we're we're, we're understanding where we're, we're going through a process of assessing a, a cyber breach, um, and then they'll give you. Give you further updates to sort of say well, what that what that actually means for you. Uh, I think the page up one wasn't too badly handled. I mean, I think there's, there's some aspects to that which um, could have been done better, but they certainly did provide um, ongoing updates to sort of say, um, you know, this, this is what's happening. So, so page up is a um, uh, recruitment software used by um, a lot of Australian businesses. Um, so a lot of big four banks use it, and they, they're still using it. So there's a, there's a, there's a good case study in terms of um, they've, they've overcome their, their adversity around a cyber breach. They've, they've now um, they've now regained favour with uh, with their business partners and, and are back out there. But I would say that it's not just a case of um, sending out one message, but it's about providing ongoing updates and and also I mean, it's backed up by actual um, breach response plan. Um, which is backed up by actually understanding the risks associated with your business. So uh, risk assessment is really important. Yeah, and um, just just on that point, so um, I'll, I'll just touch on this very quickly. So when I when I see privacy risk, I actually approach it from the pre pillar or pre line of defense uh, risk governance. So um, essentially, the first line is ownership, and the second first line of defense is ownership. The second line of defense is compliance and risk. And third line of defense audit. And I think that privacy and data protection and cybersecurity should be approached in the same way. So um, no unit is isolated. It's it's all three lines of defense and it's something that needs to be done and needs to be trained within the organization from the front to the back. Um, and it's the same when you do privacy assessment and data breach response plan. You'll see that you know when you if you have if you have a chance to look into the deeper on the OAIC website, you see that no um, no business unit is excluded in this process. It's from you know, the CEO to the guy who you really know about like, does all the audits in the company. Um, so it's it's a it's like a chain of command. It's not just one isolated. I think with that we'll wrap up this part of the evening. All the panelists will be here uh, hanging around for a little bit longer. So if you've got more questions, please feel free to come up to any of us and uh, we'll be happy to discuss further. I'd like to thank you all for your participation today, for coming and for sharing with us some information about uh, how you do things. Uh, we've got uh, refreshments and drinks and so on and networking for the next little while. So please uh, stay around and uh, I'd like to, on behalf of everyone here, I'd like to thank all panelists for sharing uh, that useful information with us.